with Russian dialogue and understanding, one of the co-organizers of the conference. Uh, the topic of this panel um, is the view from the region, Russia's neighborhood, and the future of international system. Uh, uh, having deciphered Russian motivations, preferences, and expected future trajectories of its policies in the morning, having <coughs> examined the Western responses along with its capabilities to, to translate seemingly common diagnosis of the situation into practical steps, it seems as a quite an obvious follow-up to look into the region and to listen to the people from the region, how they see it. Uh, it seems obvious, but it, it is not obvious at all. Uh, because I had an opportunity to participate in many meetings of that kind, or trying to analyze the situation around the crisis we have, uh, have been experiencing for uh, almost a year. And a lot of them, a lot of organizers typically put a full stop here after analyzing Russia and the West. I mean, as if, as if the post-Soviet area in general terms was a kind of a battlefield between the two forces. Uh, and I believe there are some dreamers on both sides, I mean, in Russia, in the West, the dreamers of Grand Bergen between US, Russia, possibly the European Union, some even say China, that they should find a solution without actually uh, the actors from the region by the table. So we are not going to follow this path. And that's why we believe that it is quite a crucial thing to ask the people, either the insiders from the region, what they feel about it, and the experts dealing with the, analyzing the situation around Russia, how do they see uh, the situation with respect to their, those countries um, and, uh, and, and their attitude and their um, influence and their vision of the international system after uh, what has happened uh, uh, this year. Uh, so I have a pleasure to introduce three speakers, two insiders from the region, Professor Mikhailo Kirsenko from Kiev, of Kiev Mohila Academy from Ukraine, uh, Ambassador Ted Japaridze, uh, the um, head of the Parliamentary Committee on Foreign Affairs in, in Georgian Parliament, a former foreign ministry, and Dr. Jeffrey Mankov from here, from CSIS, uh, Deputy Director of Europe and Eurasia Program. Uh, so, if I may ask you about 10 minutes long introductions so that we could have uh, time for the discussion with the audience. So let me pass the floor. Uh, and, uh, first to uh, Professor Kirsenko. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's a big uh, responsibility to speak immediately after Dr. Brzezinski, uh, and uh, in order not to repeat the uh, conclusion of our distinguished colleagues, I would like just to share some points, uh, some opinions with you uh, who can be, who can add uh, a couple of new aspects to what has been, done, has been said already. <coughs> First of all, we are witnessing uh, a hybrid war, a kind of, uh, of totalitarian war, in, 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 of total war, in fact, uh, total and totalitarian, uh, aimed not only at defeating enemy's uh, army or occupying territory, but a destruction of the whole infrastructure of the target area. It's first uh, observation. Next observation. From the very beginning, uh, uh, so-called uh, Commonwealth of Independent States after disintegration of the Soviet Union was regarded by Russia as a tool, as an instrument of reintegration, while uh, from the point of view of Ukraine, it was just an instrument of a civilized divorce. I, I'll just uh, mention these points because uh, uh, in such a highly professional audience, it's not necessary to develop it in more detail. <coughs> uh, we are now destined to regard events in the triangle, uh, Poland, Russia, Ukraine, and uh, I'm glad to see 
that more and more uh, the West uh, begins to regard Ukraine not as a twin sister to Russia, but I do hope that very soon it will be regarded as a twin sister to Poland, as one of the largest, not the best one of course, but the largest nations of East Central Europe. I mean all territory between Russia and Germany, Baltics and the Balkans. <clears throat> all nations of East Central Europe had appeared in self-determination after dissolution of such multinational empires, realms as Austria-Hungary, Russia, and Ottoman empires. Ukraine sh has had shared all but one a typical phenomenon of, of the regional development. The only exception was unprecedented genocide Holodomor aimed at repressive preventing resistance to the drastic communist transformation of the country. In the peacetime, it had destroyed in the interval period about 10 million lives or one third of Ukraine's population. The, the nation had been so exhausted and silenced that it can explain us a lot of subsequent fatal slowness and inconsistency in its current development. Uh, perhaps uh, Galicia and Volhynia, being out of the Soviet Union in the interwar period, had been not touched by man-made famines, uh, though these regions had suffered hardly in cruel Soviet suppression of the guerrilla war. In both regions, in both uh, in Galicia and Volhynia, 25 years ago, the, Democrat, uh, the Gem Democrats had, had won uh, the first comparatively free elections. After the Orange Maidan, over half of Ukraine followed this example, and dividing lines between Western and pro-Moscow trends coincided with borders of old Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The revolution of dignity this year has resulted in unanimous support to new presidency oriented to the European Union and North Atlantic Alliance, and finally, the recent parliament election for the first time in almost a century have excluded communists from the Ukrainian parliament, I hope forever. Deeply rooted in history, the mentality of national elites as the Polish nobles and the Ukrainian Cossacks, to lesser degree of townspeople and peasants, had been based on individual ownership, elected uh, ruler as primus inter pares, uh, Magdeburg German city law, respect for legal procedure, and first of all and most of all, mutual responsibilities of rulers and subjects in their rights and duties. These typically European civilization values sharply contradicted to the Moscow rural traditions of serfdom, communal property with land repartitions, collective responsibility, officials appointed from above, and the semi-divine charismatic Tsar, Secretary General or President at the top of social pyramid. These two absolutely opposite Western and Oriental identities just could not peacefully coexist within the same structure. Poland and Ukraine had passed longer on, or briefer periods of national statehood prior to development as constituent parts of multinational uh, uh, entities. Uh, they were more than once repartitioned and subjugated by alien neighbors. Unlike Poland and Ukraine, Moscow has never been a nation, but in the late Middle Ages had jumped from a tiny principality uh, on the Mongol periphery to a polyethnic conglomerate of Turkic, Finno Ugric, Mongol uh, tribes uh, colonized by Slavic settlers. The very name of Russia was acquired later in a desire to prove it, its imagined continuity from Kiev, or, or, or still more fantastic, uh, from Byzantium. The Orthodox had to legitimize uh, these crazy claims uh, to regional and then to global hegemony. Without such an ideology and chauvinist quasi-spiritual mythology, the Russian Federation had lost any sense of existence, raison d'etre. The same happened with Austria-Hungary uh, when, when, when it proved to be not necessary anymore as a barrier against Turkish pressure on Europe and failed to become a protector of small nations vis-a-vis -vis pan germanic and pan-Slavic assimilative threats. The Habsburg monarchy had been painfully replaced with a network of sovereign nations. After the Second World War, Germany and Japan were forced uh, uh, by the victorious allies to the liberal democracy, resulting in their respective economic miracles. Unlike them, Russia, after its complete defeat in the Cold War, was not occupied by Americans 
and the revanchists have misused it for a dangerous attempt to restore the Ancien Regime. Uh, about 100 years ago, the white, Russian White Guard could not conclude an alliance with Yusuf Pilsudski against the Soviets because Russian generals considered Poland just a part of their empire. For a similar reason, Moscow now is not able to recognize an independent nation of Ukraine. Its reintegration in Europe requires some time after genocide. The population in the southeast of Ukraine had been partly replaced with newcomers from elsewhere, whose offspring just needed time to identify themselves with the country, with their new homeland. It's a matter of so-called lands patriotism, adaptation to the old-fashioned folks patriotism. The phenomenon of Russian speakers defending Ukraine now against Russian invasion proves vanity of the Kremlin attempts at protecting Russian speakers speaking minorities in post-Soviet areas, comparable uh, to, to, the, to the attempt of the Third Reich uh, to, to protect folks Deutsche abroad. Uh, uh, every American knows that Washington is located in the east of the nation. But uh, Moscowites used to call as Central Russia their country's extreme west. With Vladivostok as far east, we could find Russia's far west somewhere close to Newfoundland, perhaps. This confusion in the people's mind means claims in Eastern Europe, and on the other hand, a subconscious feeling that behind the Urals there is no, not Russia properly. The intellectuals in Siberia still more often recollect in, mem in memory their, uh, the white and green colors of their short-lived autonomy about 100 years ago. The Asian Russia, quite self-sufficient and exploited by Moscow, is keeping loyal just because of neighboring with huge China. If Beijing one day finds some modus vivendi with Siberia, the Kremlin would not be able to hinder it. In the early 20th century, there were movements for Turkic cultural autonomy or a Tartar Bashkir state in the Russian Federation. The Muslim Congresses tried to coordinate legislation. They had uh, educational, financial, and military, in even military branches of social structures. Yet the Republic in Kazan had been crushed by the Red Guard, national committees dissolved and banned. Uh, an idea of Urals and Volga reappeared after the USSR collapse, and anniversaries of the Kazan Hanad destruction by Moscovite in the 16th century are attracting still more numerous guests from all non-Russian uh, republics of the Russian Federation till now. Even in purely Russian regions of Novgorod and Tver, uh, we can see some, uh, some uh, nostalgia and some memory of what was committed by Moscovy to, to their uh, ancestors several centuries ago. So it seems to me we could not regard uh, and we should not regard the Russian Federation as the monolith. Uh, and uh, uh, if, if we regard it as a continuation of the Soviet Union, perhaps its destiny also will be, uh, will be the continuation of the, of the, of the Soviet Union. As to Ukraine, we cannot see uh, uh, crucial antagonism between Donbas and Galicia, between East and, and West Ukraine. So without a, a foreign intervention, any, uh, any separatism would be quite, uh, quite impossible. And uh, even the Russian militias used to recruit unemployed paupers of their paid mercenaries and still more often replaced them with regular Russian Federation troop, troop, troops. Uh, the Crimea specific case should be analyzed, keeping in memory the very tragic destiny of its natives forced to emigration during two centuries after destruction of the Crimean Khanate and finally deported by the Russians to Asia. Since then, a lot of retired Soviet officers with families had settled at Peninsula and prevented a repatriation of the Crimean Tartars. This small nation forms just a part of their only homeland population, and unlike communist has no, unlike colonist, I'm sorry, has no alternative to a real autonomy in Ukraine. The Crimean dependence on water and an energy supply make Russian expansion to continental areas inevitable after the peninsula annexation. And uh, I would like just to recollect in our memory, uh, uh, 76 years ago, 
the West surrendered uh, Sudetenland to the Nazi Germany. As a result, uh, Czechoslovakia has been crushed. Later on, the Nazi Germany put forward a claim of land communication uh, to Danzig, and the, all of us know the result. Now the same situation we could observe in Crimea, and now we are observing in Donbass, because Russia is demanding uh, uh, land communication to Sebastopol, and uh, if it is not stopped, it's, it's very difficult to, to preserve, to keep European, European uh, peace. And just a couple of closing remarks. Uh, uh, so, uh, unprecedented art artificial monster of so-called new Russia uh, out of several Ukrainian regions has absolutely no prospect de 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 and is destined to defeat. Its only real explanation is the desire to capture Dnipropetrovsk, Kharkiv, and other industrial cities with their military plant plans uh, to cut off Kiev from Black Shore and uh, as a result to, to reconquer Ukraine. A small victorious war also looks and seemingly is a useful tool to distract attention from Russian authoritarianism and disastrous dependence on, on gas pipelines. Uh, and uh, uh, finally, just a couple of remarks. Uh, uh, it's impossible to deceive people for a long time. Uh, and uh, uh, let's hope that Russians will be able to, uh, to see realistically their future. Uh, uh, history usually repeats a tragedy later uh, and, and later uh, as a farce. However, the danger should not be uh, underestimated. We, should, we, we, should, we must be watchful to resist it. With, in dealing with a handful of gangsters th threatening existence of Ukraine, undermining stability and blackmailing the world with nuclear missiles, it's necessary to strengthen effective solidarity of the civilized community. Ukraine is now avant-garde at its front line and desperately fighting and expecting a kind of land lease to save more resources of the West. We cannot predict now how, the struggle will, how long the struggle will last and how many human lives, precious human lives it will cost. But final result is quite clear. As during the Battle of Britain, now the United States has again a real chance and moral duty to become a mighty arsenal of democracy. Nothing has been done unless everything has been done. Let us hope that our useful and fruitful exchange of opinions here can to some extent promote better understanding and cooperation to general uh, and common benefit. We should not waste precious time. Thank you. Thank you for this overview of historical roots of Ukraine aspirations. Now I uh, would like to give the floor to Ambassador Japaridze. How do you see the situation in Ukraine from the perspective of Georgia, especially from instance in the context of 2008 and and so Ossetia things? Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's really interesting, you know, panel, interesting topic. I'd like to, you know, greet, you know, panelists, Chairman you, those of you who are in the audience to listen to this, I would say, dramatic, you know, sad story about Russia and its, you know, neighborhood. Uh, I'd like to be, I had, you know, I can talk about this issue a long, long time, but I'd like to, at the outset, as far as we are going to speak about Russia's, you know, neighborhood, I'd like to, and as far as we are at the CSIS, in one of the influential, you know, academic, you know, centers of the United States of America, I'd like to start, uh, say a couple of words about interpretation, because the issue and topic of our, you know, panel is, you know, Russia and the neighborhood, uh, and Russia's, you know, perceptions or attitude towards the you know, neighborhood. But I'd like to say that it's not only about neighborhood, but we live in, an, in a region or in a neighborhood where there are different you know, interpretations, not only of neighborhood itself, which you know, Russia interprets its own in no way, as far as Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, I'm sure you know, Azerbaijan, Armenia, all 
other you know, post-Soviet republics, current independent states. We interpret you know, this neighborhood you know, concept notion in an absolutely different way. Same thing about you know, security. Same thing about stability, economic cooperation, uh, independence, sovereignty. So whenever we speak about you know, Russia and you know, Russia's immediate neighbors, you know, that we need to take uh, these uh, differences you know, in, in, into account. Uh, <clears throat> if we speak about Georgia uh, and Russia, and we, as you understand, we are immediate you know, neighbors, though there are several you know, Muslim enclaves between Russia and you know, Georgia, enclaves like Chechnya, Ingushetia, Dagestan, and so on, but still we will, we'll, we'll, you know, we are immediate neighbors of the Russian Federation. And uh, again, at the very outset, I need to tell you what kind of neighborhood we are talking Whenever we had you know, a war, hot war you know, with Russia, we do not have you know, diplomatic you know, relations. And we call that that we have kind of strange, I would say, but relations without you know, diplomatic you know, relations. We had a war, as I said. We lost it. We lost 20% you know, of our territories. Georgia is a dismembered, you know, defeated you know, country. And we still, in different you know, forums, in different you know, uh, conferences, and on different you know, panels, we, we, we need to talk about Russia and its, its immediate you know, neighborhood. Uh, I, uh, again, we all know that Georgia is committed, despite the fact that from time to time you may hear you know, different sort of vibrancies from this, you know, little beautiful country where I live, because it's a country where people are appointed on Mondays and maybe, you know, sacked on Tuesdays. But still we are committed, you know, despite this fact. We are, you know, committed to democratic values. We are t committed, you know, to, to our foreign policy trajectory, which is, you know, about integration into NATO, whenever it happens, and our, you know, integration into the European Union, also whenever it happens. And it's about, you know, democratic principles, values, and practice. Yes, we are not perfect. We try to be better every day. We make, you know, mistakes here and there, but, you know, it's about Georgia's, you know, uh, vision and uh, Georgia's you know, agenda. And it's absolutely different uh, from what we have, you know, in the Russian Federation. And Dr. Zhezinsky, uh, and I fully agree with you that it's not easy even to, to talk about, you know, the, these issues after uh, Dr. Zhezinsky, you know, talked so eloquently in a very strategic you know, manner. I, I'd like to recall, you know, one, whenever we speak about Georgia's, you know, for foreign policy agenda, or Georgia's, I would say, strategic, strategic agenda, which is, you know, very... Uh, linked with NATO and EU perspectives, including, you know, different formats like Good Neighborhood and the other, and Eastern Partnership, and so forth. I remember, you know, one big gathering like this, even bigger in Berlin, when due to some reasons, one of the participants, you know, raised the issue about Georgia, and during this, you know, uh, comment, uh, she mentioned, you know, Georgia's kind of Eastern Partnership and Good Neighborhood you know, policy and something like that. And there was a couple of Russians uh, in the audience, and they, you know, one of them, you know, made very, I would say, quite negative and very, uh, he got, you know, very much, you know, irritated over that, about, it was just about Georgia's uh, uh, participation in the European Union's Good Neighborhood policy. And I raised my, uh, my hand, I posed the question in the presence of, you know, close to uh, more than 100 participants, and I said, I can understand the reason of your irritation. My, I know him quite well. Maybe some of you know, know this uh, Russian also well. I understand the reason of your irritation, though I do not agree with you. But okay, you are irritated over Georgia's, you know, this aspiration to be part of the European Union, including this, you know, 
I would say, not that compre uh, complex or very uh, important uh, format of good neighborhood policy, but again, where is your good neighborhood policy? Where is, you know, Russia's good neighborhood policy? And this Russian colleague of ours, you know, he looked around and he said, Russia does not have a good neighborhood policy and uh, Russia would not have this policy in the foreseeable future. So, and again, we are talking about Russia and, you know, it's, it's a neighborhood and, and that's, you know, the position of the Russian Federation. So I think we need, while talking about neighborhood policy, uh, I think we need to focus, and it's good to be here in Washington, and uh, I'd like to raise, you know, this issue specifically here and uh, also to be heard, you know, by our European uh, partners and friends, and especially those who are from Central Europe and specifically from Poland, that, you know, we, uh, Russia's immediate neighborhood, at least, you know, those of us, you know, Georgians, uh, Ukrainians, Moldova, I would include also Azerbaijan, even Armenia, who are in so-called, you know, gray zone, because we want to join European and Euro-Atlantic, you know, structures. We understand we are realists, we are pr pr pragmatically oriented people. We understand it's a long, long, you know, term pr process. We do not want to go back where we, uh, used to belong. We do not want to be part of this customs union or whatever formats, you know, Russian, Russians have. And by the way, I do not know how they are going to implement customs union when they had this, you know, uh, kind of terrible, dramatic developments, you know, with Ukraine. But on the other hand, it's not only about Russia. We know Russia. We know Russia's policy, you know, for centuries. There is nothing new in that. But the question should be about Europe and the United States of America, and specifically, I, I think, about Europeans, that what about, you know, these countries in this so-called, you know, gray zone? We cannot stay in this kind of, you know, suspended you know, animation for a long, long time. We need, you know, clarity in this regard. Yes, we made publicly, public statements about Georgia's, Ukraine's, or whatever, European, Euro-Atlantic aspirations, but we need kind of, you know, practical decisions because we cannot stay in this, you know, kind of, uh, as I say, suspended animation in a long, long time, and we need, you know, clarity where, when, how, and what we need to do, you know, when, and whenever it happens to join NATO or the European Union. And again, it's not kind of, you know, Georgian obsession that we want to be, you know, members of the of the European Union or NATO, but I'd like to tell you, at least, you know, I don't know about Ukraine, but for Georgia, it's not about only membership, but it's about, you know, Georgia's survival as a state. So we need the clarity in this regard, and we do not need too many, you know, messages from our, you know, Western friends, mainly European, that on the uh, one hand, we understand, you know, Georgia's concerns, but on the other hand, you should take into account, you know, Russia's, you know, kind of, you know, position in, in this regard. So, again, we, we understand that. So, please deliver to us, you know, clear-cut message. We are, you know, just naive. We are not, you know, just stupid. We understand messages, and we understand that also that, you know, this European, Euro-Atlantic uh, process is a long term now. The third point, and I'd like to uh, conclude with that, we, uh, at least you know, in Georgia, and I hope in Ukraine, we understand why West in general, Europeans or Americans, you know, need cooperative Russia. Russia is a cooperative partner. It's not about friendship, it's not about, and you know, each of you, I mean, Americans, Europeans, and in Europe, it's more, you know, diverse. They have different reasons, different interests. Uh, and, for example, Americans have some security, you know, risks, challenges, and they need, you know, Russia to resolve, you know, these big, big, you know, security issues. European have, Europeans have their own, you know, agenda with them. And we understand that you need, you know, at least, you know, cooperative Russia, more or less stable. It's not about democracy, but it's about, you know, 
a partnership. But my me message would be, and I, I'm really very much delighted to be here, that uh, my dear friends, you would never have this kind of Russia, a cooperative partner, until Russia does not settle its, you know, relationship with its their, you know, immediate neighbor neighbors, and until Russia does not recognize that Ukraine should be, you know, independent and sovereign, as well as Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and they need to deal with this reality. If we want to talk about, you know, neighborhood and, you know, cooperation. I think, you know, Russian, Russians, because they still, we live, you know, in the 21st century, and, you know, what happened, some little green Chilavechiki, I don't know Chilavechiki, in, in, what's in English, Ariel? Little green, little green man, little, yeah. Little green man, you know, just redrafted the territory and, you know, landscape of a sovereign country, and we may, we're making, you know, strong statements, we're making, you know, uh, different kind of, you know, uh, political uh, steps, but, but again, that's the reality. So, uh, again, we know we all need, you know, Russia. We, need, we all need, you know, stable, peaceful, you know, Russia, economically engaged with Europe. But on the other hand, reality is that we have whatever we have in Russia. We have, you know, Putin, and we do not know he's, you know, whether he's you know, president, whether he's you know, Tsar, whether he's you know, national leader, and you know that you know people. And we deal not only with personalities, but we deal with a country where you know, population prefers to uh, freedom and independence over security. They love security more than freedom and independence. So that's the reality. And that's how we look, you know, at our perspectives you know, and in, in near future and even longer, you know, from Georgia. Thank you. Thank you for your observations. Now the floor goes to Jeffrey Mankov. How do you see the region in the context of current situation? Thank you. Um, of course, I'm in the unenviable position not only of being on the panel that follows Dr. Brzezinski, but also of being the last thing that stands between you and getting out into a cold D.C. afternoon and D.C. traffic. Um, so nevertheless, I've been asked to talk um, about the perspective from the region, from the neighborhood. Um, as Ernest said, I am from the Russia and Eurasia program here at CSIS. Um, and I think that term Eurasia is one that we should probably bring into the discussion, because a lot of what is happening in and around Ukraine really turns on this question of Eurasia. Um, what is it and what is it becoming? Uh, of course, there are different definitions of Eurasia. There are different conceptions of what that term describes, and certainly Mr. Putin has one idea, but I don't think that it's the only one. Um, if anything, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, Eurasia has become more multipolar. It has seen the development of new trade, economic, investment, political relationships among various states in the post-Soviet region and other uh, countries that geographically are located on the Eurasian continent from west to east. Um, so now you have pipelines connecting Azerbaijan, Georgia, and Turkey. You have a pipeline connecting Turkmenistan to China to the extent that China now buys more gas from Turkmenistan than Russia does. You had, in addition to Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia seeking to sign association agreements and deep and comprehensive free trade agreements with the European Union. Um, this proliferation of ties beyond the borders of the former Soviet Union is in part a natural market-driven development since the monopoly on uh, connections that was imposed by the Soviet Union no longer exists. But there's more to it than that. In part, it's the result of Russia's own inability to develop as an attractive pole uh, of attraction for its post-colonial neighbors. Um, they're dissatisfied with the offers, with the bargains that they're being offered from Russia and sought to diversify their ties, uh, in part to take advantage of better economic conditions, but in part also to hedge uh, their political dependence on Russia. Uh, this was a strategy that was pursued not only by Ukraine, but by the majority of Russia's post-Soviet neighbors. And in response to developments in Ukraine over the last year plus, um, all of these neighbors have been put in a much more difficult position. Um, this policy of seeking good relations in multiple directions, of pursuing a multi-vectoral foreign policy, has become much more difficult. 
Um, in response, of course, Russia has pursued its own vision of Eurasian integration. And this is a vision of Eurasia that is mostly a closed one, that's concentrated on tying the post-Soviet republics uh, more closely together under some form of Russian leadership uh, and making it more difficult for them to proliferate economic, political, and other ties uh, outside the borders of the former Soviet Union. And so for the countries of Eastern Europe, the South Caucasus, and Central Asia, the attitude towards this notion of Russian-led integration is in a lot of ways the most important question that they face in the aftermath of the Ukrainian crisis, uh, which broke out, of course, as part of a struggle over whether or not Ukraine uh, itself would participate in this integration process. Um, now, for the majority of the smaller post-Soviet countries, uh, the position they find themselves in is a very difficult one. Uh, their vulnerability to Russian inducements and Russian pressure remains very substantial, although it varies uh, across the region. Um, for one thing, the ideological and political doctrine that the Kremlin has advanced since uh, certainly Putin's return to the Kremlin in 2012, uh, if not before, is one that fundamentally questions the legitimacy and the viability of many of these states. Uh, we've heard from some of the earlier panelists uh, about the new Russian approach to uh, the international system, one that privileges ethnicity over sovereignty. Uh, and for countries, many of which have substantial ethnic Russian minorities, this is obviously a very threatening development. But I would argue that it goes even further than this because it's not only ethnic Russians we're talking about. There's another term that's been used um, by Putin and, and many of his advisors, uh, or compatriots. Now, this is a term that actually has legal standing uh, in Russia. It, it's been interpreted to mean different things, but basically it means anybody who identifies with the former Soviet Union, uh, anybody who sees the USSR as his homeland or their descendants. And so in that sense, uh, inhabitants of South Ossetia or Abkhazia or um, the Donbass could be Tetrasuniki, regardless of whether or not they're ethnic Russians. In, in, in essence, anybody who lived in the former USSR could be a Tetrasunik, a compatriot, and therefore um, have the right uh, to accept Russian protection. For countries that have only been independent for two decades and a little change, uh, this assault on the principle of sovereignty is a fundamental threat um, and one that they are struggling to figure out how to cope with. Um, now, for many of them, uh, the most attractive option, at least in the short run, is to hew as closely to Moscow as possible, precisely because um, of their vulnerability. Uh, it's a vulnerability that's exacerbated in some cases by the presence of substantial migrant populations for countries like Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, um, Azerbaijan. There are millions uh, of migrants working in the Russian Federation. Um, for Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan, they're two of the three countries in the world, the percentage of whose GDP um, is the most dependent on remittances. And so the economic vulnerability is very, very high. At the same time, the bulk of the former Soviet region remains very much within the Russian information space. Uh, Russian television, Russian newspapers, Russian websites uh, remain the source of news and information for at least the current generation of elites. Uh, and as we know with what's happening in the Russian information space inside Russia, we can understand uh, how events in Ukraine and elsewhere are being portrayed and what the impact of this is on these societies. There's another piece though, uh, and one that I don't think gets remarked on all that much, because especially among uh, the governments of some of the less liberal democratic states in the former Soviet Union, there's a concomitant fear besides the fear of Moscow. Uh, and that's the fear of the Maidan. For many of these leaders, many of these governments, what happened in Kiev last year was profoundly shocking. Uh, and it represents a threat to their own uh, hold on power to the patronage networks that they depend upon and to their ability to continue doing the things that they want to do. 
Uh, and so in the short term, in a lot of these countries, there's been uh, an effort to crack down. One that, uh, in contrast to the West, Moscow is not particularly alarmed by and is willing to go along with. Uh, and one of the fundamental tensions that the United States and the European Union face is reconciling support for the sovereignty and independence of these countries with the support for liberalism and democracy, which for many of them right now uh, seem to be in conflict. Um, nevertheless, the question now for uh, leaders in countries in Eastern Europe, the South Caucasus, and Central Asia is going to be over the longer term what to do about this question of integration into Russian-led multilateral organizations. Uh, I was in Kazakhstan this summer, and one of the uh, experts I met with used the analogy of a parking lot. Um, if you drive into a parking lot, there's this little apparatus where you cross in that's made up of metal spikes. And as you're driving into the parking lot, the spikes lay down and there's no problem. It's only when you try to get out that the spikes come up and do major damage to your car. Um, and this was the analogy that my interlocutor was using to describe the customs union and the Eurasian Economic Union. You can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. Um, that being the case, um, the aftermath of events in Ukraine have led elites in many of these countries to see membership in these Russian-led uh, integration organizations as at least as far as their short-term survival goes, uh, something that ought to be pursued, simply because they don't have a lot of great alternatives. Uh, they look around at what's happening elsewhere in the world, and there's a lot of depression that sets in. Um, particularly in Central Asia, there's the perception that the U.S. and its allies are withdrawing from Afghanistan. They're turning their face away from Central Asia, which has been on the front lines of that conflict for the last decade. If the United States is going away, the best thing to do is make our peace with Russian domination, at least for now. Moreover, the economic crisis, uh, which I think plays a very fundamental role in the Russian calculation, also affects the way that elites in these other countries view their options. Um, as we read now about the possibility uh, of a Grexit popping up again, uh, the potential for continued economic stagnation in Europe, the prospect of the European Union and even the United States doing more, spending more resources, getting more involved uh, in this part of the world looks to be rather far off for many of the people on the ground. Um, and as far as the United States goes, of course, there are a lot of other things that we're dealing with right now. Not only the economy, uh, but the conflict in the Middle East, ISIS, the Iranian nuclear program, Ebola, um, midterm elections, all of these things combine to make the U.S. much more introspective uh, than it has been in at least the last, much of the last decade. Uh, and that also has an impact on the psychology and the thinking of elites in these countries. Um, so, of course, the answer is not going to be the same. Um, a country like Georgia is going to continue, I think, to resist uh, integration as much as possible. Um, other countries, even those that don't see a lot of active benefits from participating, uh, countries like uh, Armenia, Kazakhstan, and others, um, are going to go along for the time being because they just don't see a lot of great options. That said, it seems likely that once they're on the inside, they're going to work to uh, impose limits on just what it is that blocks like the Customs Union or the Eurasian Union, Eurasian Economic Union, uh, can do. Um, Russian proposals for building supranational bodies within the context of these institutions, uh, a Eurasian parliament, uh, Eurasian political party alliances, things like that, have found very little support. Uh, and I would sus suspect that most likely will continue to find uh, very little support. Nevertheless, uh, this is a region that's going to be in flux for a long time uh, to come traveling around and talking to people in the South Caucasus and Central Asia, the message I heard again and again was that people in these countries would like to see greater engagement, greater presence from the West, particularly from the United States. And what kind of presence that is can be up for negotiation. Certainly more investment is something that all would welcome. Uh, all would welcome deeper um, political investment, 
uh, greater high-level interest in what's happening, and in some cases, even greater security ties. Um, I don't think there's a single answer for how this kind of engagement can be done. I don't think there's a single template that's going to be applicable to all of these countries, which in many ways are very, very different, and since the collapse of the Soviet Union have only become more different. Um, but nevertheless, even though right now the center of attention is very much on what's happening in Ukraine, this is a much bigger question. It's one that has implications for not only what kind of a relationship we want with Russia, but also what kind of a Eurasia we're going to build. Because like it or not, there is a new Eurasia that's coming into being. And our commitment and our engagement uh, with those other countries is going to say a lot about what kind of a Eurasia and what kind of a Russia we're going to be dealing with for the decades to come. Thank you for this excellent analysis of Russian leverages and vulnerabilities of the countries around, and the clear statement that the neighborhood is very diverse, actually, around Russia. So now we are coming, have been half an hour for Q&A session, so please raise your hands. Uh, uh, Sergey, first, I will, let me use also my own uh, the position and ask one question to the whole, to the panel um, at the very beginning. Since we all are just talking about uh, how the West should help uh, the region, the Ukraine for now, but the whole region, the whole post-Soviet area. But I will try to do, uh, ask a reverse question. What do the countries of the region have to offer right now? It, it, it sounds cynical and maybe a little bit mercantilistic right now under current circumstances, but nevertheless, if you need help from, from the outside, you have to somehow show your commitment and determination. And what kind of commitments, what kind of determination are those countries, countries in the region, ab willing and able to, to show? And Sergey, please. Sergey Utkin, uh, first regarding the intervention of uh, Professor Kirsenko. Um, you know, uh, Russian television on many occasions uh, made the case uh, following the uh, reported words of uh, Pre President Putin at the Bucharest NATO summit that uh, uh, Ukraine is not even a state. Uh, you are now sort of making a case that Russia is not even a, even a state. Uh, well, my opinion is that both actually may uh, continue existing in, in in the present borders, and we can uh, resolve these uh, hard issues that exist. Uh, but I agree that at some point, uh, Russia may actually face a kind of challenges of uh, uh, staying as it is as a country, and uh, this is just another reason for not playing with the fire in, in Ukraine. Uh, but. Uh, at this point in time, uh, it is Ukraine that has to uh, resolve those challenges, uh, especially in the east of the country. Uh, so when you were speaking about mentality, about the differences in mentality, uh, a number of uh, Ukrainian researchers, uh, even before the crisis, were underlining that in the east of Ukraine, you have a widely spread uh, Soviet mentality, as they put it. Uh, people who had much more in common with uh, uh, the Russian space than with the Ukrainian space. And uh, currently, uh, even uh, as uh, the rebel movement, movement uh, have uh, been instigated and supported by Russia, uh, you have a lot of uh, uh, Ukrainian citizens uh, involved in that or uh, supporting it tacitly. Uh, uh, and the question, uh, a difficult question for a uh, Ukrainian government right now, is uh, how to get those people on their side. Uh, there was a proposal integrated in the Minsk agreement that, that there should be an amnesty, there should be this uh, law on uh, special uh, regulations for municipal uh, government in those uh, areas. But now it seems to be uh, in the past already, at least uh, uh, Poroshenko and uh, his people say that uh, they will not continue with that, seeing that rebels do not respond. Uh, uh, so what's your opinion? What, what should be uh, the Ukrainian state policies uh, uh, in order to appeal the people in the Donbass and uh, uh, re reach out to them, uh, probably over the heads of uh, uh, those who um, seem to control the rebel movement. Uh, and in question to uh, Ambassador Japariz, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, with, uh, uh, the importance of, uh, the, with the importance of uh, um, the issues of uh, being integrated in the West or in be, developing relations with Russia, uh, we actually see in the last uh, uh, several months at least uh, significant growth in You we, Russians or you? Uh, the, 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 those who monitor uh, the situation in and around Georgia, we, we, we see uh, that, that uh, in the uh, last several months, probably a year, there was an, uh, a significant growth in trade between Russia and Georgia. Uh, well, uh, just according to the statistics, I mean. Uh, and there are uh, some proposals on the table on how to proceed with that. Uh, there is an idea of uh, a, a railroad through Abkhazia. There is an idea of a new road that would connect uh, uh, Dagestan to uh, Georgia. Uh, and some people think that this is uh, just another opportunity for Georgia to develop. And uh, others say that this might be a security concern. Uh, so what's your opinion? Do you think that uh, Georgia mu must go this way of uh, uh, developing trade relations with Russia further, or you think it's uh, dangerous and uh, uh, can rather be uh, avoided. James? I would also like to um, follow Sergei in making life a bit uncomfortable for our panelists, including my friends on the panel. Um, the the one enormous vulnerability that I did not hear addressed and that I rarely hear addressed, which has been there for 20 years, is the absence of the institutions and legal culture we call good governance. And on top of that, the unhealthy relationship at all levels between power and money. And it is, I'm not saying anything controversial by stating that it is those things that make it indecently easy for the Russian state to bind in key representatives of key elites into Russian policy and its development model. So I would just welcome your reflections as to why we are still talking about this as the biggest vulnerability 20 years after the Soviet Union collapsed. Thank you. Minister Hryska. Thank you. I would like to promptly react to what Mr. Utkin just said. Uh, I have probably a very short answer to you, very long question. Please uh, withdraw Russian troops and Russian guerrillas from the Donbas region and in two weeks, everything will be very quiet and peaceful. Thank you. Are there any more questions for now? Okay. So I'd like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Visishkevich to describe um, the, um, what's on the agenda of the um, dialogue uh, for of, of the dialogue for understanding the Polish-Russian dialogue and understanding uh, group, what your agenda might be. Okay, I'm, I'm just a moderator. That, that <laughs> was supposed to be my function. Nevertheless, if you have a minute or so, I can elaborate a bit on the topic. But first, the questions should go to the panelists as the heroes of the day. Um, okay, so now the, the first round of, of responses, please. Uh, be brief. Uh, thank you, Sergei. Uh, Maidan in Kiev was the only place in the world uh, where the people were struggling and dying under the European flag with 12 golden stars. Uh, the people from every part of Ukraine, from Crimea, from Donbass, and so on, Russian speakers, Ukrainian speakers, Polish speakers, Hungarian peoples, I know it from my own experience. It's the first idea. Second, uh, so-called Novorossiya or New Russia uh, had to encompass all territories from Kharkiv to Odessa, half of Ukraine. In fact, it, was, uh, it, it, it could be partly and temporarily successful only in those small districts uh, which were occupied by the Russian uh, troops and cut off 
any alternative channels of information from Kiev in order that the people could compare. Uh, I have students from everywhere, so, and it's very painful uh, to observe how these young uh, boys and girls, uh, very intelligent, very well educated, consciously go to fight and to die for their country. It's, 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 it's absolutely uh, painful and uh, desperate uh, and mass uh, phenomenon uh, in, in my country. Uh, so uh, it is just a, a matter of time that the people need to, 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 be, to, to, to look with open eyes at what is going on uh, uh, around them. There is no uh, hatred uh, towards Russia in Ukraine. There is uh, surprise and to some extent maybe hatred to those persons who initiated this war. And of course, a lot of fanaticism in these border districts uh, uh, occupied by, by Russian forces. But I do hope it's just a temporary uh, and, and short, 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 short uh, event. So we can be cautiously optimistic. Thank you. Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to start with your question. Of course, you know, we are talking about the West and what Georgia wants to receive you know, from the West, the United States of America. And your question was, you know, what Georgians or just post-Soviet, you know, republics are going to offer to the West. Uh, again, uh, whenever we speak about, you know, Georgia, and I'll speak about my own, you know, country nature, man, of course, uh, and help or assistance from United States or Europe or, of course, first of all, we appreciate that whatever being, you know, we re uh, received from, from the Western community, specifically from the United States of America, and there is an even saying in Georgia that if Georgia survived for this 20, three years of independence is because of this you know, assistance. But again, you know, I fully, I fully understand, you know, this message for, from you and the content, content of, your, of your, you know, question. Of course, you know, Georgia should help itself, you know, first of all. And uh, what we can offer, you know, to you is a stable and democratic, you know, Georgia. Georgia, which would be you know, a country of institutionalized democracy, you know, rule of law, of you know, real you know, justice, uh, good governance, as you know, Jamie, you know, just admitted, because not only Ukrainians, but including you know, Georgians, were running this you know, vicious circle of good governance, you know, trying to find out where this good governance is, almost you know, 20, 20 more years since, since our, our independence. So that's what Georgia can you know, offer to the West, stability, democracy in this part of the world. And again, you know, Georgia has certain, you know, functional, you know, perspectives as, you know, energy security, transit, and other, other you know, issues, and geography, its location. So, but, but again, you know, Georgia should become, first of all, and we are on the way, it's not easy, you, you understand, it never happens, you know, in one day or in one year. But, I'd like to ricochet, you know, back the question you, you just posed about that, and you know, Heather and I talked about what we would appreciate also from the Western community, and specifically from Americans, is that there was, you know, uh, uh, on the previous panel, one of the panelists admitted, you know, that, that there is, you know, huge amount of, you know, sympathy, there is huge amount of, you know, good, strong, you know, statements, so what we expect, you know, from our Western, you know, friends is uh, some solid policy towards, you know, post-Soviet space. There is no policy. You know. We are still instruments in different kind of, you know, gambits and, you know, whatever formats between Russia and the U.S. or the West in general. So we would appreciate some clear-cut policy towards Georgia, clear-cut policy towards Ukraine, uh, and then, then uh, I think, you know, we, we deserve to have, you know, certain... We understand that, for example, Georgia is not the significant top-level priority, 
uh, for Americans, but at, at the same time, we, we need you know, a certain amount of policy you know, towards Georgia. If we speak about Georgia and Russia, uh, you're aware for the first time Russia is hiding away, which is, <laughs> it's not happen. So it's a very interesting you know, question. Yeah, well, as I admitted, we, have, we had you know, war, hot war five, for five days and we do not have diplomatic relations with your country. We have kind of relations of which those who participate you know, in these you know, formats in Prague, Ambassador Karasin from, from Russia, Russian Deputy Foreign Minister, and Zorava Bashidze from the Georgian side, Prime Minister's you know, special representative. They call it a you know, small, small step approach. You know, they talk about different issues, trade, some exchange uh, of, uh, of different you know, products and, uh, and so forth. And okay, it's not big amount of big amount of you know, just you know, trade. I wouldn't say you know, that way, but things positive, things you know, are going on. But again, what, what matters you know, uh, for us, and I would appreciate if you get back you know, this message you know, from, from at least you know, one Georgian, one bleeding heart, you know, Georgian sitting over here is, you know, that we are still occupied country by Russia. We're, that's, you know, Georgia's in a position, and there are, you know, red lines in our relations. So, okay, there is nothing bad, you know, to, to open a railway, but, you know, we need to resolve uh, some other, you know, no less important issues before we go. And, uh, okay, let's work on these issues. I understand these are not, you know, easy issues. These are very sensitive, delicate, delicate issues. Uh, but, but again, you know, that's the message uh, answer, you know, from Georgian side. We need to deal, first of all, with these red line issues and try to resolve that. So that's my answer. Jeff, would you like to comment? Sure. Let me just touch on that for a second, and then I'll, I'll take a stab at James Shear's question. Um, all of the countries in the former Soviet Union, apart from Russia, um, it's natural that they have and need to have some kind of a relationship with Russia. Um, Russia is there, there are legacy connections that continue to exist. In a lot of cases, Russia is the most natural market um, that these countries have for whatever it is that they produce. Um, and so there's a balance that has to be struck, and this is true of Georgia as of all of the others, um, between getting the benefits from maintaining that relationship and avoiding or at least limiting as much as possible the vulnerabilities that come with it. Um, I heard when I was in Georgia recently that um, after the embargo on Georgian wine had been ended, now uh, about 70% of Georgia's wine exports go uh, to Russia again. Uh, and there's a debate among uh, Georgian wine producers and, and others whether this is a good thing or not. Um, for some, it's, it's great that the market is back, uh, and for others, this is a source of vulnerability. Um, I think the challenge is, you know, how can you ensure that countries like Georgia and the others have the best of both worlds, um, how they can continue trading with and having you know, political and, and other kinds of relationships with Russia, but not be so dependent on those relationships to the point that it constrains their sovereignty. And that's one of the real concerns when it comes to institutions like the Customs Union, the, the Eurasian, whatever it is, union, um, is what impact will those, will participation in those institutions have on the actual de facto sovereignty um, of the member countries. Um, on this issue of institutions, I mean, this is a huge, huge question. Um, not all 12 of the post-Soviet countries came into the world uh, in the same place. Some had much more historical experience uh, than others, but all of them came out of uh, a particular political culture, uh, which included institutions that they inherited from the Soviet Union, uh, and in a lot of cases, elites that they inherited from the Soviet Union, who in some cases are still there. Um, it's been, I think, a mixed bag, but there is a very particular post-Soviet political and institutional culture uh, that exists across a lot of these 
countries. I think Georgia has been very striking in its ability to um, make fundamental institutional changes uh, to help break that legacy, but it hasn't been easy. Uh, it hasn't been complete, even in Georgia, and in many of the other countries it hasn't really happened uh, at all. Uh, I'm not sure that there's a panacea uh, in terms of how you actually do it. Um, certainly to the extent that leaders in these countries want greater engagement from the West, want greater investment in particular from the West, the absence of functional institutions is one of the greatest obstacles that they face. I think a lot of them have a fundamental misunderstanding about this. It's not enough to simply go to Washington and say, please bring us American investment. Uh, you actually have to do things to make a, an investment climate where privately held companies are going to want to risk their money uh, in your country. And until that happens, I think there's going to be um, a, a problem here. Um, the more uh, value that elites in these countries put on economic and political relations with the West, I think the more leverage that gives uh, the West to push for these kind of, of fundamental institutional changes, but I don't pretend that it's going to be easy. Thank you. Just not, not to forget, uh, uh, somebody you know during previous panel uh, was talking about the capacity of the West to react, you know, appropriately, and I don't remember which one, but of the participants there, he admitted that, you know, West, when they talked about Ukraine, that Western community, Western decision makers, you know, they, they need, you know, a certain amount of time to react, and he metaphorically used that something happens in Ukraine, you know, let's say on Monday, and there is no way for the Western community to react, take decisions on Tuesday because they need, you know, time. They need, you know, some certain amount of time to, to consult with each other and so on and so on. And that may be uh, true, speaking about ra how to react to, 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 to Russian, you know, whatever Russians were doing, are doing, you know, in Ukraine. But in this regard, you know, instantly as a Georgian, you know, the, the, uh, there is uh, one interesting, you know, uh, uh, small question, you know, from uh, uh, small answer, you know, from my side. But I think the Western community, including, you know, I think it was, you know, Polish representative. I, I do not see him, you know, here. You have enough time because what Russians did in 2008, had you reacted in accordingly, you no, know, I think, you know, Russia could have done different way this year or when it happened in Ukraine. So you had much time to analyze, you know, Russia's capacity in this regard. So that's why I, whenever it's, I'm not critical about the West, I cannot be critical, but again, you know, sometimes it's time to, to, to also, you know, to speak in a, in a very clear cut way and call a spade to the bloody shovel, as people say. Thank you. We have, oh, one first here, gentlemen, over there, and then two other questions, please. Thank, thanks very much. Building on Zbigniew Brzezinski's idea for, for Finlandization of Ukraine and using Ukraine as a bridge between Europe and the West on the one hand and Russia on the other hand, to what extent do you think it would be possible to reconcile um, the association agreement with Europe and this Eurasian Economic Union? So two questions. A, could it technically be done so that Ukraine could both be a member or uh, ratify and implement the association agreement and participate in some way in the economic um, uh, union, the Re Eurasian Economic Union? And B, if you could technically do it, would it make a difference in Russian policy? Yeah, I have a Finlandization-related point as well. Uh, I was kind of struck by uh, Dr. Brzezinski's uh, uh, argument uh, concerning Crimea that with 12,000 Ukrainian troops present, not a shot was fired, and therefore that's a basis for us to write off uh, Crimea, because uh, if Ukraine wouldn't defend that territory, why should anyone else? Uh, and then that kind of leads you to the Finlandization of Ukraine argument from there. Uh, well, I, 
first, I'd, I'd like to make the point that one of the reasons no shots were fired was the tremendous pressure that interim Ukrainian government was, was placed under by the United States, by Germany, by, the, by Britain, by the EU, to not fire so as not to provoke an armed invasion. That didn't get Ukraine very far. So much for that kind of appeasement from us towards Russia. Got us Donbass subsequently. So that's not a, a great strategy, uh, as, as history has proven, recent history. Uh, let's talk about the discomfort of Russia by having NATO creep towards its border. Russia is perfectly comfortable creeping towards the NATO border. Russia is very comfortable having Belarus within its sphere, with its tanks in Belarus, very close to the Polish border, and right on the Ukrainian border with an easy drive of Kyiv. That's perfectly okay for Russia. But if Ukraine is in NATO, my God, the world falls apart. Not acceptable. That's not a good strategy for the United States to pursue, and it's suicidal for Ukraine. We can talk about the Ukrainianization of the world rather than the Finlandization, just to take Finland uh, off the hook. That's the proposal. That will get us nowhere, and it certainly will get Ukraine nowhere in the future. It basically creates an environment of economic instability, the fear of moving into that territory, because you never know when Russia will choose to expand again freely over those, those, those boundaries. So, you know, I would challenge that notion, and I'd like the, the panel to, to speak to it. What about putting Belarus on the table with the Russians and have the Russians pull out of Belarus? If you want a buffer against NATO, get the heck out of Belarus. Lithuania would be more comfortable. Poland would certainly be a lot more comfortable. And then we could challenge the premise that the NATO border being too close to Russia is the real issue here. Okay, gentlemen over there. Thank you, Maria Kavalevsky, Belarus politics, politics blog. Uh, to follow up on this question and referring to the wider question of the future of the international system, I would like to, um, to ask your opinion about what changes should be introduced in the international system to prevent conflicts like this, to, to prevent uh, invasions of Russia like this. Russia fought wars before with Georgia, uh, it, it's fighting now with Ukraine, it will fight further wars with its neighbors or with those who, who are not in content with its policies, with its self-assumed sphere of privileged interests. So it is very likely that this precedent is not a standalone precedent. This, this is a trend and it will continue. So what kind of changes should there be apart from Finlandizing all countries? that uh, do not want to be with Russia? It's going to be a challenge for the panelists to answer this question in one minute. But, but it's, about, maybe. <laughs> it's about the future of international okay. system. And the last question from Professor Mandara. Thank you. I wanted to underline the contradiction in terms in what um, Jeffrey Monkov presented, because it is a Russian <laughs> contradiction in terms about ethnicity and um, and former Soviet compatriots, we know that it simply doesn't work. You cannot defend the concept of Russian, ethnic Russian, and then say that anybody who speaks Russian or was uh, included in the Russian Empire or Soviet Union is, uh, is, is a Russian. So um, my question to you is, should we really pay that much attention to this kind of, um, <coughs> of ideological confusion? And um, that, because it's not just a question, for example, of the Crimean Tatars. It's a question that if, you know, when you go to Ukraine, the majority of inhabitants of Ukraine speak uh, Ukrainian and Russian, and their problem is to be non not to be ethnic Ukrainians, but to be Ukrainian nationals. So it seems to me that where we are strong in the discussion uh, with, with the Russian is that the, the Ukrainians have uh, adopted a rule of law definition of a Ukrainian national, and that's the only thing that counts. 
And so um, this is also why I do not understand this uh, obsolete discussion about Finlandization or, uh, or even, I would say, about the Eurasian Union, that the you know, customs union may be, but I really do not see anything happening uh, uh, recently uh, that uh, would uh, help um, Moscow uh, get something a little more organized or get more benefit uh, from this uh, so-called uh, Eurasian Union, because the Eurasian Union is institutional. So there the, the Russians would play you know, the card of institutional you know, st state arrangement, and we, we know that they are not very good at that. Okay, that was the final round, so now the panelists have, well, maximum two minutes for comments, <laughs> if you want to keep the time. Uh, let me propose the opposite order right now to move through the whole process. Okay, Jeff. Um, yeah, so should we pay attention to this contradiction between ethnic Russians and compatriots? I don't think we need to delve down into the details. It is contradictory. Um, I think what we need to pay attention to is that these justifications are out there and they can be used instrumentally. Um, and this gets to, I think Heather was quoting this earlier, um, we had uh, Professor Timothy Snyder giving a talk here uh, a couple of weeks ago where he used the term uh, uh, applied postmodernism to talk about the organizing principle of Russian foreign policy, which again is this notion that there's no settled truth, you know, capital T truth. Um, and I think, it, you know, it's the same thing here, you know, who is a, who's a Russian, who's a compatriot, I get to say. Um, and it's, that's the problem. It's not that whether this is, these two definitions are compatible or not, it's that they're held out there uh, as justifications that can be invoked for doing things that established international law doesn't allow you to do. Um, on the question of what changes to the international system are needed, uh, I'm not going to even try to answer that in 30 seconds or less, but I would just say that what's missing in a lot of the discussion, it, it's not as missing in the discussion, but it's missing on the ground, is uh, deterrence. Um, we have a conception of deterrence that we have inherited from the Cold War that doesn't work very well in this context because nobody's talking about massive retaliation. But it's how do you deter some of these other things that fall below the threshold uh, that would invoke something like uh, massive retaliation both inside NATO, countries that are bounded by Article 4 and Article 5, and in countries uh, outside of NATO. Um, I'll leave the other questions to the, the other panelists. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In a, in a very brief way, uh, let me react. You know, first of all, I, I know this issue of Finlandization because, you know, just before people started talking about Ukraine and this, you know, model of uh, interaction, you know, with Ru Russia a couple of years ago, I was part of, you know, Carnegie Format European Security Initiative, and we've been talking long <coughs> about Georgia and Finlandization, you know, idea. I think, you know, sounds good, uh, but it's good for, for Finland because it's, and I heard that about my uh, Finnish, you know, friends, but it's different history, different kind of relations, and they had themselves, you know, Finns, big, big, you know, doubt that, you know, Finlandization as a model would fit, for example, a country like Georgia because it's absolutely different environment, different history, different, you know, different Russia. And Russia, Russian, uh, Finland, you know, re relations and, you know, Georgian, you know, Russian relations are absolutely, you know, different, different category of fish. Uh, but speaking about models and having here uh, our Pope, uh, friends from Poland, I, I would, you know, just humbly, you know, deliver this message, you know, to them that I think, you know, Central Europeans should play, you know, a very special role in this, in our part of the world, in uh, the world which is not, you know, which is close to the NATO uh, European Union space, but countries which are, as I, as, I, as I said, you know, in my intervention, you know, countries that happen to be in gray zone. And I think as far as you are here, dear friends from Poland, I think Poland has, you know, special mission being uh, in NATO, being, you know, in the European Union, you have you know, a special, special role, special function to take care you of know, your own security. It's not only Georgia's or Ukrainian security, but it's about also you know, your security. And Poland, 
was you know, very much you know, visible in the couple of years ago. Now you have it you know, disappeared. I don't know the reasons. There are different reasons for that. But I think Central Europe, a front line in our states, Baltic states, of course, and if you know, Finland makes decision, we welcome Finland also in, in, in this loop. Regarding the association agreement, and Georgia has you know, this unique opportunity to have you know, direct interaction with the European Union, but it's not about only Georgia, European Union. As I said, it's long, long you know, term, you know, let's say, you know, project, but it's unique opportunity for Georgia, uh, uh, James, it's about to become a normal to, uh, to implement this real and functioning uh, internal you know, reforms and regarding this good governance. So I, I, ho I hope that Georgians would, would uh, use you know, uh, this opportunity. Uh, three brief considerations. First, uh, 200 years ago, English-speaking Americans and 100 years ago, English-speaking Irish didn't like British Empire too much. Uh, second, uh, percentage of Russian schools in Ukraine is higher than the, much higher than percentage of ethnic Russian minority. There is no Ukrainian school in Russian Federation, in spite of the fact there is several million of Ukrainians there. Next. Um, Unlike Georgians, unlike Finns, unlike Poles, the Ukrainians were persecuted just for using native language. And now, uh, in, 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 in the Crimea, yeah. and now, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, and now in the Crimea and in occupied, uh, uh, occupied districts of Donbass, uh, Ukrainian speakers are risking their lives and a lot of them disappear for speaking native language. I don't comment it, it's quite clear. So uh, Ukraine, is, uh, and on the other hand, you, Russian speakers of Ukraine proved to be very good patriots defending Ukraine's independence. Uh, so it is very conscious choice. It's not a choice of native language. It's a choice of policy, of existence, of consciousness, of feeling European, and not, not, uh, not Americans, of course, but, but feeling European. And uh, this choice, choice, is, uh, choice is absolutely irreversible. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Just, uh, no, sorry. We are out of time, out of time. <laughs> Let me just uh, ask the audience to thank for the panelists for their contributions. And the floor goes to Heather yes. for concluding remarks. Very briefly, thank you all so much. I know it's been a long day, uh, but this day did not disappoint. Uh, what a tremendous amount of insights. We have been provoked. It, uh, we have been challenged in our thinking. We've gained great insights. And uh, clearly, for me, the conversation must continue. And we'll, con we'll continue that conversation with Tato uh, immediately following this discussion. Uh, a huge, huge thanks to the Center for Polish-Russian Dialogue and Understanding. Uh, it is their inspiration and their support that makes this possible. So I'll throw the microphone over to Dr. Dembski. But thank you all so much. Uh, thank you very much, Hala. And uh, thank you for uh, cooperation. Um, we are very happy that we could um, um, provide this platform of dialogue between Europe and the United States about uh, uh, Russia. And I, would, I have two groups of people I would like to thank in particular. Uh, Professor Adam Daniel Rothfeld, uh, Volodymyr Ochrysko, uh, Marie Mendra, uh, Sergei Utkin, uh, Roman Kuźniar, Tedo Czaparidze, uh, Mikola Kirsenko, James Scher, representing Europe. And, uh, and Angela Stent, Paul, uh, Paul Jones, John Herbs, Zbigniew Brzeziński, Geoffrey Mankov, uh, representing the uh, US side. And I would like to thank all your team. I would like to uh, thank my team, Ernest Wyciszkiewicz and Katarzyna Kołakowska, the, for putting all these puzzles together. Thank you very much for your attention, and I think uh, we'll continue uh, this kind of uh, format in the future. <laughs>